For anyone that hasn't seen it already, there's a truly inspiring documentary that's just come out on Rugby Pass about Benetton and Italy fly half Ian McKinley. Uh, he lost sight in one eye after an incident on the rugby field and has battled back to play international rugby. It's an amazing story uh, and we thought we'd get the man himself on the line to talk about it. Ian, how are you, mate? I'm good. How are you keeping? Good, good. It was an amazing story on, on Rugby Pass. What was it like to sort of relive it all and, and, and tell your story? Yeah, I suppose when you're when you're the one sort of living it, you don't sort of uh, look back on uh, on everything that's that's uh, happened. So whenever you see something like that in in uh, in a thirty minute block, is uh, you know is pretty uh, is interesting to watch. So um, no, I was happy with how it went, and uh, yeah, hopefully other people uh, took something out of it. Mate, it's, it's definitely been well received, that's for sure. Can you just briefly uh, just tell the listeners um, what happened in the original incident um, when you were at the bottom of that rock? Yeah, so back in 2010, I was just playing a club game and found myself on my back uh, at the bottom of a rock and just unfortunately a teammate just went in with his foot and uh, his stu- or basically his boot caught my uh, my face or just went uh, straight into my face like a sort of a stamping motion and just unfortunately the stud burst my eyeball and uh, yeah, was uh, rushed straight away to hospital and uh, had emergency surgery and uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't too pretty. <laughs> to say the least, but um, I suppose more shock than anything else. But yeah, that was basically, that was the, the injury at the time. And then just after that, you regained about 70% of, it, of your vision, didn't you? Um, and on your first game back, were you eye gouged? Yes. So when I got back, so I got back playing six months after the, after the accident. And um, yeah, about, it happened a couple of times uh, that I was that I was gouged in my, my good eye. So uh, again, it's not... Uh, like I've said it before, it's not something that I want to, you know, fully publicise, but it's it's definitely an important part of the story because that's you know that's the reason that I wear the goggles is just to protect my uh, one functional eye. So yeah, they're not not uh, not incidents. So you know, I I will hold with uh, any fond memories, but uh, yeah, unfortunately well, happens. Yeah, so, exactly, mate. Go on, uh, just say, where were you playing when that happened? Oh, just for my club at the time in Ireland. Just club, club yeah, yeah. Oh dear. And just to, yeah. just talk us through the decision as well, because your story, like it, it, it is amazing to see you back on the rugby field and, and and playing to the standard that you're playing at now, having been through what you've been through. But talk us through that kind of decision process. Like we spoke when I was over in Italy, but in terms of you thought your career was over, you spoke to Joe Smith, you spoke to the powers that be uh, in Ireland, and then you move over to Italy. And, and what kind of changed your mind to start playing again? I- I suppose it was a couple of a couple of factors. Um, one was certainly having you know unfinished business. Um, when I when I retired at 21, it's it's not something you you know I think every sports person wants to wants to stop on their on their own terms, and then to be to stop at the age of 21 when you when you think you've got a lot more to to do is obviously difficult to uh, is difficult to uh, comprehend as it were. And and then I suppose. Um, Something again. I, I don't publicise too much, but I suppose Nevin, de- Nevin uh, Spencer's death as well was a big thing. It was a, obviously a huge story in Ireland, and I would have played a bit with him. And uh, to lose someone so young, you, you sort of realise how, uh, how precious life is. And you just, uh, if you think you have an opportunity to go at it again, you you just do it. So that's that was sort of my thought process. And obviously, you moved over to Italy originally uh, to coach, uh, and then you started playing again for Viadana, and obviously that's grown into bigger and better things now, playing for Italy. I mean, that must be phenomenal to go. The whole story of, of what happened to playing international rugby, and especially last month, I know the game didn't go overly well for, for Italy, but playing against Ireland over in Chicago for Italy, that must just uh, have been a, an amazing moment for you. Yeah, I suppose it was certainly surreal when you're when you're lining, lining out against the, the anthem of your, you know, the country of your birth. But I suppose at the end of the day, you know, you're there to uh, to win a rugby game. And yeah, as you said, the result was was not good. So if I'm to be totally honest, I didn't fully, you know, obviously didn't enjoy the experience when you lose 56-7. It's not, uh, it's not the best thing, but um, I suppose... You know, later on in my career, I can look back on it with uh, with fond memories. So, um, you know, who, who knows? Maybe if you get another chance, hopefully the results will go a bit better. <laughs> Mate, definitely. And talking about getting another chance and and the kind of results, the results for the Benetton team over then, having been there myself, but also Italy as well, the big one against Georgia that we saw. How good a job is Conor O'Shea doing? You've come from a very successful pedigree playing in Ireland, <clears throat> going over to Italy where they've been a bit static for a few years. Conor's comes over... And he's done a fantastic job. Just 
tell us what, how he's done and how he's affected Italian rugby on the whole. Yeah, I think it's it's important to you know hold the strong values within Italian rugby and, and Italian people, you know, to, to keep that uh, to keep those things very very much in. But also, obviously, Connor's brought his experience from Harlequins in, and you know, getting the right people in in the right areas. I know Pete Atkinson coming in has been a big uh, a big help from the S and C side of things. But as well, um, you know, Kieran Crowley, our coach at Benetton, and Mike Bradley uh, at Zebra deserve also a huge amount of credit as well with the work they're doing. You know, um, the results now that that they're getting. Um, you know, you can see, uh, uh, you know, the consistency in in uh, in our games, and you know, international rugby. I know is completely different to club club level, but uh, hopefully, you know, with the, the experience that we're getting, all the guys are getting now, at you know, producing better results. Hopefully, that can uh, that can be produced now on an international stage. And then just going back to you playing, um, you know, obviously only got sight in one eye. Uh, as a kicker, ex kicker myself, it's got yeah. it's hard enough anyway with 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 two eyes and around belly but um just talk to me about <laughs> kicking now and just for our listeners how hard is it kicking with one eye is it different from one side of the field to the other obviously with the um definition of which eye is looking at the, the posts yeah i suppose uh you know place kicking for me is sort of it sort of remained the same i suppose what 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 is a bit more tricky is just the kicking out of hand um because i'm left footed and i'm blind in my left eye so sometimes you put the ball out there and you don't actually see the ball <laughs> which doesn't help um <laughs> But, you know, you just sort of adapt. And I think, as you would know, you know, yourself as a kicker, you just, you know, you almost kick on instinct as well at the same time. So, you know, I've adapted a, a couple of things, which I'm always working on. It's not a finished article by any means, you know, I make mistakes all the time. But, um, you know, it's just a work in progress. <laughs> that's, that's the best way I can describe it. Well, you do an amazing job, mate, to be honest. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. And also, not just on that sense, but you're fluent in Italian as well, aren't you? Am I right in saying that? I heard you speaking a bit uh, of lingo. I understood I a can, bit. I, a little, you know, un um, paio um, di parole. If I can order at a bar, then that's, you know, that's enough to get me, enough to keep me going. Can you just, can you give, <laughs> yeah. can you give us a line of how, if me and Goody, we are married, but if we weren't married and get divorced after Christmas, we don't go home with any Christmas presents. If we were to get divorced, then move to Italy and try to woo a woman, what could yeah. we say? Give us a line that we could say all the listeners that want to head over to Italy who are single or might not be single. Uh, well, if you know, if you're talking to a woman, I suppose you just say, say una, una bellissima donna. Uh, so you're a beautiful woman. And I don't know. <laughs> hey, that works <laughs> for you, mate. I'll save, I'll save, I'll save Negri is standing beside me here. Shout, <laughs> shout well, that's the only, the only two words that he's got um, in the in the two years he's been here. But uh, <laughs> hey, just, just tell me that line one more time. <laughs> <laughs> the ciao bella <laughs> <laughs> ciao bella ciao bella yeah but unfortunately it doesn't really work for Seb so we'll uh, we'll have to work on it with him but he's a big old unit <laughs> he is a unit yeah Right, yeah, yeah. Ian, thank you so much for joining no us. Problem. And um, yeah, if we can we can see that on Rugby Pass. It's a truly inspiring documentary, and um, and I wish you all the best for the future, mate. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers, Appreciate it, mate. Pal. Cheers, mate. Right. Take care. Bye. 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 That's unbelievable, isn't it? I've commentated on him quite a few times when he's played um, in the sort of Champions Cup and stuff like that. Watching him play and kick, first and foremost, he's a good-looking guy. Yeah. Like, proper good-looking guy. Yeah. A bit of a man crush. Secondly, just watching him play and how graceful he is playing, and you actually forget he's blind in one eye, apart from you see his goggles. And when he when he says that, you know, I'm blind in my left eye, I'm left-footed, you stick it out there. And I, you start thinking about it as a kicker. There's times when you try and hook a ball around a corner and stuff like that. He is kicking it without being able to see that sort of side of his body. Yeah, the it's, it's, vision. it's phenomenal. I spoke to Brendan Mackin and a couple of other people uh, kind of in the lead up to doing the documentary and going to Italy to meet him and, and having met him, so the aftermath of it. And I'm not just saying this because we've had him on the phone and trying to talk him up because he, he, was, he was a gent of a bloke for one letting us do the documentary and, and how welcome he was when I was there. He was in line with Sexton apparently, that talented, mm. until the accident happened. Mm. He was well thought of and you only have to watch the documentary to see how highly Leo Cullen speaks of him, Connor O'Shea, and this is not people feeling sorry for what's happened. This is people talking about how good a player, what he adds to the changing room mm. on and off the field. So, what yeah, a legend. What yeah a legend. Mate, it's awesome. Awesome to have him on.